stop it and start it again. Okay. Welcome to business valuation. This is part two. Um, not that you had to necessarily be in part one to get what we're going to go over today, but part one, we looked at some basic ratios to analyze when you're analyzing a profit and loss on a balance sheet. Um, but today I want to go over kind of what you see them doing in Shark Tank when somebody comes on and they're looking for an investment into their business. So let me share my screen and I'll show you what the process is. All right, we go to sheets.new. I love that. Interesting thing I learned. You know how I've said that you can now, I've seen in some cases where I can export reports from QuickBooks Online to Google Sheets. Apparently that feature is reserved for QuickBooks Online Advanced. I was told by somebody at Intuit yesterday that that feature is only available in QuickBooks Online Advanced companies. Because she was, because I'm going to be writing an article soon about some of my favorite things about QBO Advanced and she sent me a thing showing some of the newer features that have been added recently and that was one of them and I said that's only available in advance and she said yeah and so I've been poking around in my non-advanced client companies and sure enough I have not seen a case where I was able to export through Google Sheets in those so Greg if you find a company that's not in advanced that can export to Google Sheets let me know send me a screenshot yeah the one that I have open right now does not have it Mm -hmm. But I do recall there that being covered on the um, like the what's new. Maybe I missed the part where they said that it's going to be advanced, advanced only. only. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I just thought of that when I was opening up Google Sheets. So you know, when they come on the Shark Tank, the first thing everyone always says is what. You know, they introduce themselves. They say, I, "My company is such and such," and. We're looking for X number of dollars in investment in exchange for Y percent of our company, right? So let's say they're looking for an investment of $100,000, right? We'll keep the numbers simple. And percent of ownership, they're going to come up with a percentage. And from that, we can derive what the total valuation is, right? And you notice in the beginning of the show, as soon as they get these two numbers out, all the sharks look down and start sketching out on their pad. I've, I've never actually seen what they write, but I'm assuming this is what they're calculating and writing down, right? What's the valuation? What are they, how are they valuing their company? Because then really the rest of the show is about proving to the sharks that it's worth as much as you're suggesting it is, right? In some respects, that's really what the rest of the whole pitch is about, convincing them that it's worth at least that, if not more, so that they'll want to make an investment in your company, right? So let's say they say um, they're looking to give away 40% ownership, right? So 0.4, okay? The formula is very simple. We take the investment amount divided by the percent of ownership. So that's effectively a valuation of a quarter of a million dollars, right? And so I used to sit there in this, watching the show and I'd also watch the Twitter feed and I would do this. I would have a spreadsheet up here because I was just curious, kind of wanted to follow along and see, right? And so that's how you get the valuation. If I'm saying that 40% of my company is worth 100,000, then you gross that up. 100% of the company is worth 250,000, right? So that's how you do that. Now, the rest of this is really then about, you know, and they're all about the numbers. So you have to be able to show them some numbers. So you want to do some kind of a financial model. And I have a course that went through the, through this um, a long time ago. Maybe I'll revive it if people tell me they're interested. That kind of gave you a deep dive on what I'm going to show you here today. But it's really about coming up with some kind of projections, right? And, and, and looking at the historical sales and, and, you know, that's what they'll ask them about. What are your sales? <clears throat> How many units are you selling? And so on, right? A lot of times they don't care about the dollars as much as they care about the units because, <clears throat> I, you know, and again, a lot of this is my sort of best guess from watching this and knowing a thing or two at least about the, the accounting and financial side of things is that my guess is they don't care as much about the dollars, especially when these are newer companies, but they love to see volume because if they see volume, then they know they can generate dollars out of that, right? Then, we, then it's just a matter of tweaking the pricing, doing what needs to be done um, <clears throat> to get that volume to convert to dollars, right? So we need some kind of revenue projections 
right? And probably some kind of history. They always want to know that there's some history, that they've got a proven track record, right? Oftentimes I've seen if they come in with no track record, the sharks are done, they're out. They don't want to invest in the company. Got to have a proof of concept. So we do a quick timeline here and let's just say we're in November. So we'll start now, November 1, 19. Uh, let's see if Google Sheets has the e-date formula yet. They do. This is a really cool formula, especially for doing a timeline like this. It's just e-date and you point in this case to the one to the left because that's the month I want to start from, comma, and the number one in this case is how many months I want to increment that by, right? So I want to add one month to that date and now I can copy that across. Okay, and then we'll just format that. One thing I wish they would do differently is the formatting options, the way they're laid out. You have to kind of go way down here. It at least keeps track of the kind of format I ask for frequently. Because initially you have to sort of customize the double digit date format across the board. And let's see if they let me do the text version. So if I do more date and time formats, Right, now I can do the month as a three letter abbreviation. Right, I don't really care about the day. Right, just month and year, boom. Um, didn't want the forward slash. There we go, that looks better. Okay, these things are important. Right, they're little aesthetic things, but it makes the data that you're presenting much easier to read, right? Now we could do something here, like where we say volume, right, in other words, units, price, right? And let's just assume we have one product or maybe we're just kind of averaging out the information about the products just to get a quick sketch at the very least to start with, right? So let's say I know based on November, we're halfway through the month. Let's say I know I'm selling a thousand units, right? Down here, we'll say total revenue, right? Let's say I'm selling something, uh, a thousand units of it at, uh, I don't know, $150 a piece, right? So that's 15,000 in monthly revenue, right? 150,000, sorry. I'm not that good with numbers. Um, and I'll copy that across. And with the revenue projections, the key is to be conservative. You know, do you want to show growth, but you want to be realistic and use numbers that you know you can, you know, pretty easily do or at least justify. You know, you want it, it's got to be believable to the person potentially investing in your company, right? And you can put a static formula and just say, let's assume a 5% increase in volume each month, right? So you take uh, the previous month's volume times 1.05, right? That will get me the new volume with the increase. Okay, and we'll assume no change in price. So I'll copy the price across. And now I can copy that across because I've got a nice little assumption in there. And then we might wanna just fix the rounding issues, right? So equals round that whole thing, comma zero, no decimal places. I just want a round number. Okay, and then we can get rid of the decimals on the volume, we don't need that. Okay, so there in less than five minutes, I showed you how you can sketch out a quick little revenue model. Obviously you can make this, you know, as detailed and as, as complex as you want it to be. But for today's purpose, I just wanted to show you at least how to get a layout done for this, right? And of course you can take this whole section and replicate it for, if you have 10 different products, do one section just like this, just copy and paste it for each product and get a grand total, right? And then, then we need to know what the COGS is, the cost of goods sold, and then we need the gross profit as derived from the cost of goods sold, of course, is the total revenue minus the cost of goods sold, right? So I'll copy that across. Let me go. Okay, and the cost of goods sold, what we could do is we could create an assumption, right, about what the profit margin percentage is, right? 
gross margin percentage. So let's say we think that our, it's a 35% margin, right? So cost gets sold is gonna be that times, important here, one minus the gross profit, right? Because if the gross profit is 30%, the cost gets sold is 35%, the cost of gets sold is the flip side of that, right? And now we can always test that, make sure our thinking is sound in the formula. So if I now take the gross profit and divide it by the total revenue, I wanna make sure I get back to 35%, right? I always check myself. I don't trust my head to do this right necessarily. And there it is, and we made this a variable, right? Which we can certainly change. So I click in here and I say, all right, this is grabbing the percentage here. It's in cell C15. So what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that as I copy it to the right, it keeps with the C reference. So I put a dollar sign in front of it. And what that does is it makes the reference absolute so that I can copy this across and the formula still works. Okay, and again, always double, triple checking my work. Let's calculate that gross profit percentage again, 35% across the board. So it's definitely working, okay? And now, and we'll get come back to this, but now I, the way I have this set up, I like because I can play around with this number and change it to get a desired result. If I feel I'm being too aggressive or if I feel I'm being too conservative, I can, you know, too aggressive, I can lower the gross margin. If I feel I'm being too conservative, I can increase the gross margin, right? And I can do it by simply changing this number and everything updates across the board, okay? So OPEX, right, our operating expenses. Again, just to keep it simple for today's purposes, let's assume some kind of a percentage, right? Let's say operating expenses are 50% of the gross profit. So same kind of thing. We take the gross profit times the operating expenses. We hold that reference in column C constant. Okay, and then we have net income, which of course is the gross profit minus the operating expenses. And since it's 50%, it's gonna look the same. So I wanna change that because it's gonna, it gets a little confusing when you do it that way. Let's say this is 40%. I just don't want the net income to be exactly equal to the gross profit, it just gets weird. Okay, so now, now we get to the fun part. Because remember, we're talking about somebody investing and owning 40% of our company, right? So, Initial investment, can't type. I'll just make it equal to that. We want 100 grand. Okay. Uh, investor share of NI, net income, is going to equal that, the net income times the percent of ownership. Okay, and then that percent of ownership, again, column C, we need to hold that constant because now I wanna copy that across, right? And then we need the cumulative share. And you'll see where I'm going with this. First month, it's exactly equal. After that, it's the prior month's cumulative share plus the current month's share. because now we wanna look at investor ROI, which equals that divided by their initial investment. All right, and then that needs to be held constant. Boom. So at this point, they pretty much break even. They get their money back pretty quickly. Now, by the way, I've talked to a lot of people about this kind of stuff. I've talked to a lot of people in the startup world. This would be very untypical 
regardless of what the industry, it usually takes a good year or two for the investor to recover their funds. So we can look at this and say, bottom line, uh, if we don't think that's realistic, you know, if we think that's being too uh, optimistic, to, then let's lower the gross margin percentage, right? Or let's increase the OPEX percentage of, of uh, gross profit. Let's say this is more like 75%, right? That might be a lot more realistic. But you see how easy that makes it to tweak the model, right? Because I set up my drivers here. Um, let's increase that just to show the decimals. Because now here's also how you can tweak the deal. You can say, well, hey, you know what? This may not be as attractive as we'd like to make it for the potential investor. Although it's not, like I said, in most cases, you know, they're going to be expecting it to take a good year or two to recover their investment, right? When they've cumulatively earned back based on their share of the net income, when they've cumulatively earned back a hundred grand, that's when they've recovered their investment, right? That's when they start seeing an ROI where their ROI goes past a hundred percent. Okay. And keep in mind, 100% ROI really means they've just made their money back. They haven't actually made any money on the deal yet. So you can fix this and make it more attractive by saying, well, let's change the valuation. How do I change the valuation? I can either keep the percentage of ownership the same and ask for less of an investment, or I can increase their percentage of ownership, right? And if you watch the show Shark Tank, you'll see they go both ways on that. In some cases, they'll say, hey, you know what? Um, I'll give you 50000 for a 40% share, right? Because now if I go 50,000, as you'll see, when I hit enter, we're doubling the valuation of the business. I mean, we're having it, right? We're knocking the valuation in half because now we're saying, I'm going to give you half the money for the same amount of ownership. So we're saying, we think it's valued at that much. Okay. But now this, see how it sweetens the deal for the investor. They get to recover their money a lot faster this way. Right, because now it obviously takes less time to reach their initial investment when their initial investment is half the amount of money and everything else is the same. Okay, the other way to do it is to say, I'll give you the 100 grand, but I want a bigger stake. I want, I want uh, 75%. Right, now we're really uh, lowering the valuation, although not by as much as lowering the investment to 50 grand. Right. But so again, it just changes the whole deal around. So now in this scenario, they're recovering their investment and going a little bit beyond in July of 2020. So bottom line, and I did this, I sketched this out in under a half an hour. And this is just to give you a sketch, obviously, in, in the case of a real situation, if I'm an accountant representing my client, I'm going to get a lot more detailed than this in doing their projections. But this is how I would approach, you know, at least starting to put the numbers together with these kind of high level assumptions. And keep in mind that all of this is on is built on the premise that we have an accurate set of historical books. In fact, the bulletproof set of historical books, because a lot of these assumptions we're going to make, for example, about the gross margin percentage and the OPEX percent of gross profit. I should make that clear in the label here. Percent of GP. Um, this is going to be based on what we will need to be very reliable or bulletproof historical data, right? I need to be able to look back and say, well, historically, this is what our gross profit percentage has been. And this is what our percent of gross profit has been on the operating expenses side. So that these are fair assumptions to make, right? Because then it's just a question of getting the volume. If we can get the volume and we can keep these two items the same, then this is how we can hit these numbers. And so this is how you can either sweeten the deal to make it more attractive to the investor or maybe stand fast and say, no, you know what? I'm sticking. I think that this company is worth 250000 right? And another way to gauge that is how many months do I have in here? Two. Let's just do it like this. Here's month one. Let's get two more months in here to get a full 12-month cycle. And you see how nice and easy that is when you have formulas well written that you can just copy and paste the whole column over to get the next couple of months in. So if we, the other way to start looking at this is a lot of times valuation for businesses is done based on revenues, right? 
usually if I'm actually trying to sell the company, then it's going to be based on some multiple of revenue. Sometimes it's just times one, right? But at this rate, I'm asking for a hundred grand. I'm valuing it at 250,000. The projected annual revenues over the next 12 months is more than uh, $2 million, right? So looked at that way, this might actually be a pretty sweet deal. All right, this one I don't total because this is already cumulative. Right, so like I said, generally speaking, without considering the industry and a lot of other factors, for an investor to recover their initial investment inside of a year is really good. But that also means you have a tougher job of selling this to them because they're gonna be skeptical, right? And again, that's where really solid historical data is gonna come in, right? And I've learned, cause I, you know, I'm, I'm always curious about these things. It's very interesting to me. I've learned that actually a lot of the deals you see get done on Shark Tank fall apart after the show, right? And I'm guessing a lot of times that's probably because then they start really picking apart the numbers before they actually sign anything and they find problems and say, yeah, this isn't what you represented to us on the show. I'm sure they do a lot of due diligence before getting on the show. I've had clients who were applying to be on the show, and, and so I actually know this from firsthand experience that, uh, you know, I've had to help them make sure they had good solid numbers, you know, to submit to the producers. So, uh, you know, that's going to be important. Again, this, that's why this is, you know, all the stuff I'm doing as far as a bulletproof webinar series is really coming under the heading of what you can do now that you have bulletproof books, right? If you have good solid books where you can prove every number, then you can start doing things like this and things like this is where the real value comes in, in terms of what I can do with or for a business. You know, when I have good reliable information, when I can show solid historical data that shows consistently our gross profit is 35%, I can support that. I can show anybody who's questioning these numbers. I can say, no, look at the last, you know, the last 12 months before now, you can see that consistently we're able to do this, right? That's the kind of stuff you need to have behind something like what I've just laid out here. But like I said, in under 30 minutes, I was able to sketch out, you know, a pretty solid sketch of you know some numbers and 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 giving you the template that you can use to figure out okay maybe this does look too aggressive right then uh you know maybe we need to tweak this maybe we need to give them 50 percent right and maybe this needs to be 85 percent right maybe we're being too aggressive calling it 75 percent of gross profit right because again, as soon as they see that they're being told they're going to recover their investment inside the first year, they're likely going to be skeptical. I mean, unless you have a company that out the gate has really done well and you have the data to support that. Yeah. Um, but that's why you want to sit down and start doing some planning like this. This is the beauty of what's called a financial model is you get to play with different scenarios and see if this, you know, if you need to sweeten the deal and make it better for them or not. So, you know, there's a lot of different, uh, there's not a lot, I should say, there's maybe a dozen different methods for valuing a business. But at the end of the way, to me, this is the most practical one where you value it based in, in, in a sense on what is going to look very attractive to the investor balance with oftentimes we don't want to give away half of our company, right? But you may have to, to get the investment. Maybe you're asking for 250,000, right? But you're willing to give them 75% of the company because maybe this quarter of a million dollars is everything you need to make the difference between surviving and not surviving. Maybe you need that, you know, a lot of the shows, what's interesting to me is they'll come on and basically they say they need the money because the demand for their products has gotten so high that they can't keep up with production and they need an infusion of capital to produce so they don't lose sales. To me, that is like the best reason ever for asking for an investor to come in and help you out, right? It pretty much says the minute you give me this money, I'm going to be able to produce and meet the demand for my product, which means your ROI should turn around relatively quickly, right? So that's the beauty of having a model like this and understanding how to build it. And like I said, under 30 minutes, you saw me build it. So I'll stop sharing my screen and see if anybody's got any questions. And don't forget to unmute.
Marshall, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Now I can hear you. Did you have a question or? No. Oh, that okay. You turn your I camera like on. I thought you. I thought you were coming in. Okay, no worries. Yeah, no, I did with the screen when you were sharing your screen. I didn't realize the camera was not. <laughs> gotcha. No I was worries. looking at the screen share, not the not the top there. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Anyone? Greg, Kelly. I know we have a few others in the peanut gallery with no cameras. You make it look so simple, Seth. I mean, I know it in a way it is, but it's just the like we talked about your secret magic is this that you kind of just sit down and you're like, yeah, and you just do this, this, and this, <laughs> and and just sort of like systematically go through the process, and it just it kind of helps it look really clear and clean. And um, I found sometimes when I step away, it's not always as easy, so it's nice to have a video follow up so I could go back and tune back in again. Right. And I'll make sure you guys have access to this template that I've just built out here real quick, you know, so you can follow along. And then, so the real question then that I have for you is having seen me go through it just now and assuming you didn't wait, like, let's say we end the call and you just go open up a blank spreadsheet, you know, with what I've just shown you, do you feel confident that you would be able to build something like it out, you know, without too much difficulty? Yes. Okay. That's what I, I want to hear. Question. Yes. Question is, and I think I asked it before, um, you're looking at cost of goods sold. If you're a service organization, you, you don't have physical goods. You mm -hmm. don't manufacture anything but provide service. How do you value the COGS? In a, in your payroll. In a okay. service business, your payroll is your inventory, which means that's okay. your cost of goods sold. Okay. And so just payroll, not yeah. any other stuff. I mean, any other cost you can think of that would be direct cost that, that you need to generate in order to generate revenue can okay, be looked so at. So rent will come into it too if, if you actually have people that are in offices. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah rent, rent certainly. Although rent you're going to have regardless of whether or not you have sales, right? That's how in a service business I do tend to distinguish what's cost gets sold versus what's operating expenses, right? Okay. The difference is usually without sales, I don't have the costs that I'm putting in cost to get sold, right? Okay, okay, okay. So <clears throat> for me as a, as a bookkeeper who has multiple employees, I put my employee costs and I have a couple of sub, subcontractors. I put those sub costs into the cost to get sold, but I also package into my monthly pricing. I package in subscriptions to QuickBooks Online and maybe Bill.com or some other solutions that we can Right, so those costs certainly could be put into cost of goods sold. So those those subscriptions fall into cost of goods sold. Now I do have other subscriptions that that I pay for, you know, maybe the music on my computer for nine bucks a month. That's that's not going to be a cost of goods sold subscription. Right. And so you gotta make take care and time to separate those two right and if you if for some reason you're still kind of stuck on this you know the other option is just don't include any cost of goods sold just go straight to opex right and say everything's in operating expenses and what does that look like as a percentage of my revenue right that's the other way that you uh you know you, you can uh you know can can approach this and i would say that unless it unless it's a manu, this is just my thought is unless it isn't like a manufacturing business or like you really have like a, a scenario where you have traditional cost of goods sold, uh, investors probably don't care. They just want to see what the actual expenses are. I mean, whether you categorize them as cogs or not in a service business is probably irrelevant to them. Yeah. Well, depending on the investor, some really do want things broken out in a way that historically or for your industry, is what they're used to seeing in terms of, you know, a lot of, especially if it's a savvy investor, they're going to have ideas already about what should be in cost gets sold and what shouldn't, right? And for that matter, they may have ideas about how they want you to rework the financials in accordance with how they want to see it, at which point you do it because if that's going to make the difference between get a, getting a quarter million dollar investment and not, I'm going to do whatever they want, you know? I don't really care. Keep in mind that, that from a tax standpoint, there's no such thing as cost gets sold unless I'm actually selling inventory. And then cost gets sold is only the cost that I need to incur in order to get my inventory ready for sale. Right. So for tax purposes, 
on a service business, there is no cost of goods sold. You can use the cost of goods sold line as a lot of us do in order to just see what our direct expenses against revenue are. But if you ever take a close look at your tax return, whoever's preparing that is not going to put that in cost of goods sold. They're going to move it to the other deduction section of the tax return. So that just kind of gives you some help in terms of understanding that in a service business, we're only using cost of goods sold as a reporting mechanism as a, and as a way of analyzing the financial information about our business, right? Mm. Tax-wise, no such thing as COGS in a business that doesn't sell inventory. So, but again, we don't care about taxes here. Our goal is to, you know, paint the financial picture as accurately as we can so that we can honestly and with integrity bring in investors who can help us take that business from where it is today to where we want to go to level three or whatever, right? That's the key. So that's why going back to that other comment, if, if my potential investor says, hey, I don't want these things in cost of goods sold, but I do want these, uh, whatever they say, their wish is my command. I will, I will present the financials to them in the exact way that they ask me to, because there's no reason not, unless I feel that they're asking me to do something that's really misleading or unscrupulous somehow. You know, by and large, it's not about that. It's about a lot of times these guys have experience and they have certain formulas that they're using to help them decide what's a good investment and what isn't. And in order for their formulas to work, they need them presented just a certain way. So, so that's about it. I mean, like I said, when I started this series, I won't always take up a whole hour, um, but you know where to find me if you have questions. And as with the others, I will have this posted up on the website, uh, hopefully within the next 24 hours, so you can review this and practice building your own little projection. Yep, yeah, you said that the uh, Google Sheet will be part of the share that we can access the Google Sheet to play around with. Yeah, on the website where the where the um, the video is, I'll put a link there. Since it's a Google Sheet, it's not a template I can have you download. So there'll be a link, and you'll get a view only copy. Just click here where it says file, and right, click and make a your, copy. Yeah. Okay. And that way you'll have your own editable version, so you can go play with it. And you know, then what I would do is I would just make a duplicate of this tab and go sketch out your own model and just see if you can replicate what I've done. That's the best way to learn how to do this. Sure. Okay. All right, and uh, that's that. So, um, you know, check back on the events page of my website because I'm going to be continuing to do these every Wednesday at 1 o'clock Pacific. And uh, if you have any questions at all, reach out to me. You know how to find me. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. And this Friday Zoom, by the way, we're going to do like an introductory Zapier session. So if you haven't played with Zapier yet and you want to learn how to use a really powerful tool, the tool as far as I'm concerned, for automating workflows, join me on Friday morning. Excellent. All right, I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.